Hi, this is Daryl Cagle, uh, NBCNews.com cartoonist, chatting with uh, R.J. Matson, who is a longtime contributor to our site, and um, uh, our readers should be well familiar with his work. He's drawn for the New York Observer and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and is now the cartoonist for Roll Call. Um, and have been all along for, I don't know, 20 years. <laughs> Yeah. Down to one. <laughs> so, uh, you want to talk a little bit about your experience at the Post Dispatch? Um, sure, well, I had a great seven years at the Post Dispatch and I've got no regrets. Um, so, it was, a, it was a dream job, sort of a fulfillment of a career drawing editorial cartoons, and uh, it's the kind of thing I happily would have done for another 20, 30 years, um, but uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen at that paper with the kind of uh, Debt that the that the uh, Lee Corporation took on when they purchased uh, the Post Dispatch from um, the Bullitzer family. And kind of a common story we're hearing. About yeah, that. well, they just they borrowed a billion and a half dollars by the Post Dispatch and maybe ten other papers that the Post owned, and uh, had trouble coming up with 250 million to pay off a, a loan, and and uh, couldn't raise junk bonds, and finally went through a prepackaged bankruptcy and. Uh, came out of that, and uh, still the uh, the paper just wasn't generating the revenue they needed to pay off their their debts. Um, you know, I think when they bought the Post Dispatch, they're making about 20% profit a year, and they kind of were counting on that year over year for the next 10 years. And a, a family-owned paper might have weathered the hard times and been happy to take one or two percent profit. Um, and not lay everybody off, but this wasn't in the cards uh, in this situation. So I had survived maybe four rounds of, of layoffs of 20 or more people at a time, and, and, the, and when I first showed up at the paper in 2005, uh, months after the, the sale went through, um, the staff was cut from about a newsroom of over 300, it was cut about by about 80 or 90 positions through layoffs and buyouts. And, uh, so the whole time I was there, I was just telling uh, Daryl at, at lunch, um, I, I showed up and I was the only guy with a smile on my face. Everybody else was walking around like it was a funeral. And, uh, um, and, and so for the next seven years, it was just a funeral that got progressively sadder and grimmer. <laughs> so what do you see as the future for the editorial cartooning? Um, I, I, you know, it's a... I, I honestly think newspapers might be dying and um, and editorial pages might be dying. I just don't see publishers really are that interested in that anymore. Um, I was at a paper that loved and their tradition, of, they were so proud of their tradition of uh, editorial cartooning. I was the fifth editor editorial cartoonist they'd had in um, 100 years. And two of those cartoonists, Bill Malden and uh, Scherfius, were only on the job for five years. The other two, Fitzsimmons and Englehart, I'm not sorry, no, Fitzpatrick and Englehart were there 45 years apiece. Um, so I joked with my wife when I showed up that I was due for another 45 years to keep the, the pattern going, <laughs> but it wasn't meant to be. Well, you've still got a great spot as the daily cartoonist for Roll Call. Yeah, that's a great spot. And um, I've been, uh, believe it or not, I started working at Roll Call almost right out of college doing illustrations and stuff. And I watched that paper grow from a staff of five people. It was just a little, almost like a fanzine for Congress, published by a guy who had worked at Variety and had the idea he could do the same kind of thing, covered Washington as a company town. And I showed up and got work for them out of college, uh, doing caricatures and illustrations. And maybe 10 years later, they decided they'd try running editorial cartoons. Um, and so when I first started, it was just a weekly paper. And then it's grown to uh, four days a week, and uh, it merged. It became part. It was owned by the Economist for a while, and uh, it was merged with uh, Congressional Quarterly. And I mean, they have a staff of about 200 people there now. It's a pretty big operation. So it's an impressive paper. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a good. But place then they to stop be. publishing for a month every so often when Congress is out of session. Which well, is nice. Built-in vacations. <laughs> That's <all right. laughs> very yeah. good. Yeah. So, what's next for you? Uh, next is. Um, I guess I'm back where I was seven years ago, working, doing editorial cartoons and doing a lot of freelance work, and which is what I used to do when I lived in New York City. I worked for Roll Call and The Observer. And I always looked at my uh, career 
like it was a, a department store and I had two big anchor tenants, the Observer and Roll Call, and then I would get lots of freelance work, um, Mad Magazine, various other magazines, Rolling Stone, occasional thing for the New Yorker. So it's to rebuild that kind of freelance thing. You're and a crazy prolific artist. It's hard to imagine how you can churn out so much. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's almost like, I don't know. Well, I learned to get real fast when I was at the Post Dispatch, and, and, and uh, I didn't give up Roll Call or the Observer. I did the Observer for five years. That was a weekly. So for a whole for a stretch, I was doing uh, 11 cartoons a week. Wow. Um, Your drawing style doesn't look fast. And uh, you know, computers made it fast. Um, there were lots of shortcuts that I could take that I never used to take before. And I used to have a very intense cross hatching style that was uh, really slow. Um, so, no, I went from spending several hours on a cartoon to one or two or three at the most. Wow. So, um, so anyway, that's one thing I learned. But I, I kept those jobs because I truly feared that the post-dispatch thing wouldn't be permanent, and I didn't want to give up everything I'd sort of built to get that point, and then, and then uh, have it all have it all disappear. So you're so, giving up on St. Louis as well? Uh, yeah, there's just no other work there, so uh, no family and no reason to really stay there, and it's uh, hot as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be moving out of St. Louis, probably coming back east, somewhere near Washington or maybe somewhere near New York City. So, what do you think is next for our editorial cartooning profession? We're losing the jobs, but the cartoons remain popular. Uh, yeah. We have as many newspapers subscribing to the cartoons as still seen in syndication, seen that much more on the web. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you cut the heart out of it when you lose the jobs. So, uh, w what do you see? I don't know. You know, in my experience, I've always, uh, it, it, whether it was for the New York Observer or Roll Call, I was always doing some really locally specific cartoons. And when I was in St. Louis, it was fun to do a lot of national stuff, but the cartoons that the audience really loved were the, were the local the local cartoons. And car the newspapers are giving up on this. It's just a total shame. I think it's a disaster for them. Um, I think originally, when there were three or four papers in a town, and uh, the editorial page would hire a cartoonist to help brand themselves and, and, and define themselves politically in competition with the other papers, cartoonists were m even more essential than they are now. Now it's like, I almost feel like it's a, an appendage that's just always been there and that is useless in a sense because, but, but people love them and it's just a tradition that, um, you know, could carry on, but it, it doesn't seem like it's absolutely necessary for a paper to have an editorial cartoonist. Um, it's kind of a sad thought, but it's such a difficult job to do well day after day. Um, I just don't see how cartoonists can, can crank out stuff like that unless it's a you know, full-page job that's treated with a lot of respect by the publisher. It's, it's, the cartoonist is essentially a, a columnist and a, and a vital uh, voice for the paper and a vital voice for the community. I mean, people love to see events in their town reflected back in editorial cartoons, whether it's something as simple as your, your team winning the World Series and a great cartoon after that, or uh, your team losing your superstar baseball player and a good cartoon after that, or a scandal down at the police department. Um, people want to see that in the newspaper. And, uh, um, you know, if newspapers give up on that, they're really sort of given up on, on, on covering their, their own local their local scene. You know, you've got a kind of a vital uh, cartooning environment here in D.C. You've got Wyant in the Hill mm -hmm. and Worker in Politico and Tolls in the Post. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a town with four cartoonists. That's that's kind of exciting. Uh, yeah, that'll be exciting. I'll have some colleagues. If I, if I come move back here, I'll have some uh, colleagues to hang out with. <laughs> so you <laughs> used to, it used to be just you and uh, well, Herblock. I used to, when I started drawing cartoons in Roll Call, um, I think there was Herblock in the Post and me in Roll Call, and I don't think there were any other uh, cartoonists in town. Um, used to have Nate Beeler here, and he left, and it looks like the examiner's not hiring anybody to yeah. replace him. Yeah, the examiner came into being, I don't know, in the, in the mid-90s, I think. Late 90s, I can't remember when, but there was a stretch when it was just uh, Herblock and myself and uh, no one else, really.
These are all uh, nice looking substantial papers. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, this is a, a boom town for journalism of all kinds. Um, probably the only one left in America. What, what are, what's, give us an example of one of the racy well, cartoons you can get past your editor. Well, a lot of times I would know that my editor wouldn't go for it, but I'd say, this is just for you, have a laugh. Uh, and uh, the most recent one I can think of was uh, uh, after uh, the p report came out on Paterno, the Lewis Free Report, and I did a drawing of Paterno, sort of opening a door like he's come out of purgatory, looking to the next room, and, uh, and he's saying, uh, oh, this must be heaven. Look at all the Catholic bishops that are in here. <laughs> and uh, That sounds like a good cartoon to me. They wouldn't print that? They wouldn't print that. St. Louis is a very, very Catholic town, and uh, they're, a little, they're a little shy about criticizing the church and the editorial page there. Oh, heck, uh, you're not comparing him to a pedophile priest. You're comparing <laughs> him to the bishop. To that the bishop. I know. I thought it was a great gag and a good cartoon. Um, they wouldn't go near it. Oh, heck. Yeah. But anyway, so something like that you'll see on the site, yes. <laughs> That's what I want to see. Good okay. deal. Thanks a lot, RJ. Right, thanks.